Hello and welcome to the third lecture. In this lecture, I'll present some, quote, higher dimensional examples. However, before doing so, I'd like to say a few words about just ordinary linear algebra. A powerful technique in, say, I don't know, neuroscience, is that we can think of a square n by n matrix as a labeled directed graph, i.e. a network. The graph has n nodes and an edge between i and j labeled by the i jth entry of the matrix. One usually imagines this as a system of n degrees of freedom, and the edges describe the interaction between these degrees of freedom. This matrix stores a lot of information about this network. For example, random walks or diffusion processes. I mean, whenever you have a matrix, you have an ODE. One of the primary benefits of this theory of, quote, higher linear algebra is that we can perform similar maneuvers but in higher dimensions. Here, I'm not using the term dimension in the sense of the number of rows of a matrix, i.e. the number of degrees of freedom, but in the sense of higher dimensional objects like spheres, manifolds, and stratified spaces like simplicial complexes. The combinatorics of these general constructions can become quite involved and can severely obstruct the formation of a strong geometric intuition. For this reason, I'll try to keep my examples as down to earth as possible leaving the more interesting examples for later. We'll start with a fairly universal example, the two cell. So I wanna linearize this object, which I'll call chains on the two cell. This will be a chain complex, so the first thing I need to do is write down a list of vector spaces. As the two cell has two vertices, the degree zero piece will consist of formal linear combinations of these two vertices, V0 and V1. As the two cell has two edges, the degree one piece will consist of formal linear combinations of these two edges, gamma zero and gamma one. And now for the higher dimensional piece, which is the two dimensional face connecting gamma zero and gamma one. As the two cell has only one face, the degree two piece will consist of formal linear combinations of a single face, sigma. And everything not in degree zero, one or two is the zero vector space. Okay, so let's go into the interesting part, the boundary operator, which encodes how these various pieces glue to the pieces one dimension lower. As there's nothing in degree minus one, the boundary of V0 and V1 is zero. Next, we need to define how the boundary operator acts on the degree one piece. This is exactly the same as our construction with graphs. And now for the new part, what is the boundary of sigma? For the sake of pedagogy, I'll give a back of the envelope explanation. Just as the case of graphs, I've chosen an orientation on sigma. I won't go into what an orientation actually is. For now, just think of it as like a higher dimensional version of a choice of a direction on an edge. In dimension three, this is a choice of handedness. Think the right hand rule. In this case, I've chosen my orientation to be from up to down and left to right. Recall that a direction on an edge allows us to think of an edge as connecting one vertex to another. Similarly, we can think of a face as connecting one edge to another. In this case, sigma connects gamma zero to gamma one. Therefore, the boundary of sigma is gamma one minus gamma zero. And that's it. I just defined for you a chain complex. Let's try to visualize this in terms of what's called a cell diagram. So I tried to design a lecture introducing the visual piece by piece, but it was just too involved and I'm too lazy. So yeah, this is what the final product looks like. Each dot corresponds to an independent basis vector so that the number of dots in each layer is the dimension of that degree of the complex. As the dimension of the dot increases, the dot gets lighter. The boundary map is a matrix of zeros, ones, and negative ones, which I colored as follows. Orange denotes one, while the blue denotes negative one. I drew the zeros as dark green, which coincidentally was the background color. Of course, we cannot yet declare ourselves victorious in constructing a chain complex. We need to check that the master equation holds. In other words, we have to check that the boundary operator squares to zero. Note that as everything below zero and above two is zero, we only need to check that the boundary of the boundary of sigma is zero. One usually says this is due to, quote, degree reasons, which is a mathematician's version of dimensional analysis in science. Like dimensional analysis in science, degree arguments can be extremely powerful. Before I show you the derivation, I recommend that y'all pause the video and try to deduce it yourself. 
And here it is. Note that the master equation holds due to an apparently miraculous cancellation. I invite y'all to ponder how and why this occurs. For example, try making different choices for the entry of the boundary matrix. Feel free to comment on why you think the master equation holds. Loosely, I think of the master equation as guaranteeing that the various pieces of different dimensions fit together in a compatible manner which aligns with our geometric intuition. Finally, note that, according to the visual language in last lecture, the boundary of the unique two-simplex sigma is a closed loop wrapping around the two-cell. This motivates the most infamous aphorism, which geometrically interprets the master equation, a boundary has no boundary. As a next example, try your best to construct a reasonable model for chains on a quote, two simplex, aka a triangle, using the following orientation and nomenclature. Check that the master equation holds. Finally, think over the relationship between the indices of the faces, edges, and vertices, and the coefficients of the boundary operator. Hint, they will be either 1 or minus 1, which is minus 1 raised to an even or an odd power. Okay, so now for a slightly more interesting object, a two-dimensional sphere abbreviated as S2. Here, I'm going to present the two-sphere, which is, which is hollow by the way, as being obtained by gluing together a pair of two cells along their one-dimensional boundary, which are oriented as follows. There are many other ways to present this object. I've chosen this one because I've already constructed the two cell for y'all. We can linearize this object as we did with the two cell, which can be expressed as the following cell diagram. Try to see if you can pick out how each of these two cells wrap around the equator. That should basically tell you what's happening. As before, we should probably check that the master equation holds. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I've always found these proofs pretty boring and uninformative. In fact, a big perk of the modern higher categorical methods is that it generates chain complexes whose boundary maps are guaranteed to satisfy the master equation. So I'm gonna do something I probably shouldn't do. I'm gonna present without explanation a kind of networky way of seeing that the boundary map squares to zero. Maybe this makes sense to you, maybe it doesn't. Just examine it as you would some cave drawing from prehistoric time. Feel free to leave a comment below about it. A chain complex is like a vector space in that you can generate interesting equations by adding, subtracting, dilating, whatever its constituents. And there's a distinguished zero. But a chain complex also has a geometric feel to it, like a topological space. Warning, this takes some serious work to make sense of that in a precise way. But it's been done under the heading of the doled con correspondence. If you don't know what a topological space is, just Google definition of topological space. There, you'll find what is possibly the most opaque mathematical definition of all time. It takes like at least a month of some metric space foreplay to get students to swallow that one. Um, Jean de La Fontaine puts it nicely, on hasard de perdre un volant trop gagné. We risk failure in wanting too much. Thanks for tuning in. Let me know if there were any especially confusing parts.